We will continue with the third and final presentation by Dr. Tito Guerrero III, who began his tenure as Vice President with the Middle States Commission on Higher Education in April 2011. Dr. Guerrero obtained his Bachelor of Science in Health Education and Biology from Texas A&M University, his Master of Education from the University of North Texas, and his Doctorate in Education from Harvard University. He most recently worked as the President of Cambridge College. Among his previous roles are included the positions of Vice President and Associate Provost for Diversity with Texas A&M University and President of both Stephen F. Austin State University and the University of Southern Colorado. In addition, Dr. Guerrero has served as a Director for the American Council on Education, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, and the Society for the Advancement of Management and American Humanist. Dr. Guerrero currently serves as a member of the Board of Visitors for a Air University of the United States Air Force. Dr. Guerrero received the Harvard Alumni of Color Achievement Award in 2007, and he was selected among the 100 most influential Hispanics in the United States by Hispanic Business Magazine in 2006, and among the 100 most influential Hispanics in Massachusetts by El Planeta in 2010. Dr. Guerrero is also the recipient of several fellowships, including the Academic Leadership Academic Fellowship, the Kellogg National Leadership Fellowship, the Ford Foundation Graduate Fellowship, the National Science Foundation Fellowship, and the Educational Policy Leadership Fellowship. Please help me welcome Dr. Tito Guerrero III. Thank you. Uh, I hope our sponsors will not take offense, but I'm going to close this. I, I'd like to. Uh, first, let me say thank you uh, to HETS for the invitation. Uh, let me also say thank you to those individuals we met last night and were recognized as founders of HETS. Uh, the nature of the work that you do is very important, and I hope to be able to demonstrate the value that I attach to education by the remarks that I have to make. Uh, for me, uh, a high quality higher education is a very personal matter. Uh, it's, some, it's clearly something that has, a very, has had a very real impact on my own life. Uh, those of you who are, uh, work within the jurisdiction of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education and who attended our annual conference last month may recall a presentation by Dr. Paul LeBlanc, president of Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, he began his presentation by providing a picture of his family and then used that as a springboard for his remarks. He asked the people in the audience attending the event how many were the first in their family to ever go to college. And I was amazed at the large number of hands that went up that certainly applies to me. My mother went to the fourth grade. My dad went all the way to the sixth grade. My wife, who is also Mexican-American, her father went to the second grade, and her mother went to the fourth grade. And both of us had implanted in us uh, from a very early time the importance and the value of an education. Now, you can tell by looking at my head, I've been around for a number of years. I have quite a few years on me. My odometer has been running for quite a while. I grew up in a time in South Texas uh, during what is known as the Jim Crow era. Uh, and at that time, it was common practice for children from Mexican-American families who started school to begin at grade zero. The assumption was that anybody coming from a Spanish-speaking family clearly did not have sufficient mastery of the English language to do well with the rigors of the first grade curriculum. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit when I talk about the nature of my work with the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. But Paul LeBlanc reminded me that sometimes it's helpful for us to look back at how far we've been able to come. And uh, my mom and dad, despite not having graduated from high school, were very enterprising, uh, started a small mom and pop grocery store, 
that eventually grew to the point, I mean, I, I hesitate to call it a supermarket, um, but we did have three registers, and I thought that was fairly impressive. And um, one of the things that we did at the store uh, was to deliver groceries to people who would call in. And I remember once going to a home to deliver groceries for a customer of ours, and I'd never been to this house before, and I remember being surprised that the floor for this home was dirt. There was no wood, there was no tile, it was dirt. It was very clean, very swept dirt, but it was dirt. So anyway, I remember coming back to the score and telling my mom, you know, you're not gonna believe this. I just went to a home and their floor was dirt. And And my mother said, that's the kind of home that I grew up in. So they pushed me really hard as, as a young man. And um, I remember, uh, I, I learned, sometimes I learned sort of in spite of the experiences that I had in schools. It was usually classmates, Anglo classmates, who would tell me about different opportunities. And that's been sort of the story of my life. But I remember once, those of you who are of, of my generation may also have been beneficiaries of the Ford Foundation Graduate Fellowship Program. And uh, I was fortunate to receive one of those. My wife was too. And I can remember, and I was admitted to Harvard, as was noted earlier. I can remember when I was getting ready to leave Texas to go study at Harvard, my mom asked me, hijo, por qué no vas al community college que está aquí cerca? You know, get your doctorate from there. And I, I said, Mom, you can't get a doctorate degree at, uh, so, and I recall uh, later on, some Anglos in town would ask my mom and dad, uh, where's your son, by the way, Tito, where, where, where did he go? And my parents would say, oh, he's up, up in the Northeast someplace, going to some school, Harvard, I think is the name of it. And the Anglos would say, what? Your son went to Harvard? And it got to the point where after a while, my parents said, Sao en el cuello, you know. <laughs> my son went to Harvard. And uh, I recall when uh, they had to replace their automobile, they went to the Ford dealership and bought a Ford. And we had been a Chevy family my entire life up until then. So I asked him, why in the world did you buy a Ford automobile? And they said, uh, we wanted to show our appreciation. And I said, it wasn't the Ford Motor Company that sent me <laughs> the Ford <laughs> Foundation, but uh, thank you anyway. So anyway, uh, for me, uh, a high quality education is of some, it's very personal, it's very important to me. And very definitely, I would not be where I am today were it not for the opportunity to receive a high quality post-secondary education. So, the role that I have at Middle States Commission on Higher Education as a Vice President, uh, I take very seriously. I think uh, the, the whole dynamic of accreditation is to focus on quality assurance and the experiences that we provide our students. And I am really enamored by the concept of engaging our peers, our colleagues, in the process of helping to assess and ascertain how well we're doing what we're doing in higher education. You know, currently on Capitol Hill and other places, there are attacks on accreditation. There are people who will say, well, accreditation is a little bit like brothers-in-law taking care of each other, scratching each other's back. But folks, when you want to make sure that you have security in higher, I mean, in, in, in the air industry, in air traffic, don't you want to have somebody who knows how to fly an airplane and all of the issues that need to be addressed when you're looking at whether or not there are safety issues? Or if you're looking at some, if you're concerned about the quality of surgical procedures that are provided in an operating room, 
Don't you want to have somebody who knows something about what's happening in, a, in, a, in, a, in an operation room in order to make improvements? Or if you want to determine how well an operation is doing financially, wouldn't you like to have somebody who's doing audits who knows something about finances? I mean, the very notion of calling on people, on colleagues, who are passionate and care about the nature of the work that we do is something that has great value to me. And I have, that has been driven home for me big time in the three years that I've been affiliated with middle states. Now, I don't want to sound overly defensive. I know that we have things that we need to work on. Uh, not long ago, the seven regional accrediting bodies had a meeting in Boston where people like myself colleagues of mine, and the presidents of the different groups came together to reflect on the nature of our work. And it was amazing to me to discover how we use different terms in different ways, and how the practices in which we engage vary from region to region. In my own career, I have worked in four jurisdictions. Most of the years have been within the Sachs region, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. I did work for a while in the NEASC region, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. I'm now in middle states. And before, when I was president of the University of Southern Colorado, I was with uh, the jurisdiction of the Higher Learning Commission. And I think we need to find ways to come together as folks who do this kind of work to make sure that we're all working from a common playbook and using language that everyone understands. I will say that the thing that I appreciate about middle states is that it, its focus is on the mission of an institution. I don't know that I would say that about all, all, all of my colleagues in accreditation. We tend not to be as proscriptive as I think other accrediting bodies are, and our work is supposed to be about determining whether or not an institution is attending or is doing things that are consistent with its mission. Now, a challenge that I take personally, and the reason I told you a little bit about my background, part of it was to try to establish why a quality higher education is important to me. But another reason is because in some ways, I have experiences even with all this gray hair and all the mileage that I have on my, on my odometer, I keep getting these experiences of, here we go again. Here we go again. And I'll give you an example. The first, and I'm not going to name institutions, but the first institution that I visited here in Puerto Rico as part of my work with the Middle States Commission on Higher Education told me, you said, Dr. Guerrero, todo lo que hacemos es en español. The classes that we offer, the official documents that we do, the interactions, the evaluations by students, I hope somebody in Philadelphia appreciates how difficult it is for us to take what we do, capture it in a language that we don't normally use. And folks, in the short time that I've been there, I have to say that there are people who have a tendency to make assumptions about how well prepared or the nature of the quality of the experiences are provided on the basis of a grammatical error. That is something that I am trying to make sure that we do something about. Whenever, hopefully, the institutions that I'm working with here in Puerto Rico will confirm that my orientation has been to try to be of help to you, not to play gotcha politics. One of the, you know, most of my career in higher education has been on your side of the accreditation relationship. So I tell the institutions when I come to visit them that when I was a provost or when I was a president, if I had had a magic wand, I would have used it to create a friend at the accrediting agency. And that's what I hope to be to those institutions with which I work. Now, that doesn't mean that we look the other way or that we ignore some of the issues that have been addressed by our colleague at ETS or our, our friend from Columbia. Clearly, we are concerned about quality, precisely because of the very reasons that I indicated earlier. And I remember in talking to this person who was reminding me that everything that we do in Puerto Rico is in Spanish, it reminded me of the Fred Astaire saying, now some of you are not old enough to remember, there was a guy, a famous actor by the name of Fred Astaire in the movies who was famous for his impressive dancing. And you know, and some women will point out, you know, it's great, Fred Astaire was a great dancer, but what about Ginger Rogers? 
Ginger Rogers did every step that Fred Astaire did, plus she did it backwards and she did it in high heels. We're asking the Puerto Rican institutions to be Ginger Rogers, and we need to give them credit for that. One of the things that, uh, that has been a source of concern for me, and this may be unique to the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, it may not. Uh, the very first year that I worked at the commission, three of the institutions assigned to me were placed on warning, purely on the basis of a written document, something known as a periodic review report. This is the report that submitted five years after the decennial visit occurred. The three teams that went to each of the institutions, and by the way, none of them was a Puerto Rican institution. Each of the teams that went to visit these schools would look at me and say, why are we here? And it was clearly a matter of something, the school not having communicated as well as it could have in writing the wonderful things that they were doing. Even now, we have an institution that has been asked to do, provide presentations on their wonderful assessment processes that had been found wanting by a team that came to visit. I believe that part of that had to do with certain presumptions that are formed by people who are monolingual. And I, those of you who are monolingual, please, I'm not trying to step on toes, but I think we do need to recognize that we all form lenses as part of life experiences through which we filter information and how we form our assumptions. I genuinely look forward to interacting with my colleagues on the panel and to responding to any questions or concerns that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guerra.